The human kidney, unsurprisingly, shaped like a kidney bean. Most people have two, and if you let your arms hang by your side, they'll be roughly in line with your elbows, which is higher than most people think. They filter your blood to remove metabolic waste like urea and creatinine and achieve osmoregulation by keeping your water and salts in balance. This bit here is the cortex, Latin for bark, so it's the outer bit, much like you have a cerebral cortex in your brain. The medulla, Latin for pith or marrow, is the middle, and the word medulla has a lot of the same letters as middle, medulla, middle, which will hopefully help you remember. Speaking of Latin, it gives us the word renal for all things kidney. So the blood vessels going into and coming out of the kidney are called the renal artery and renal vein. And I know veins are often color-coded blue because they appear that way through your skin thanks to the scattering of light. But as part of my somewhat obsessive crusade to educate the world that deoxygenated blood is dark red, that's what I'm attempted to do here. Also, I'm going to be cliched later on and use blue for water. My artistic skills leave a lot to be desired, but the renal artery there is supposed to be a little narrower than the vein to increase the pressure of that blood flow. So here in our outer cortex, outer part of the kidney, our cortex, and then our medulla, we have lots of tiny tubes where blood is filtered and the bits you don't keep are called urine. It drains into the renal pelvis, which subsequently drains via the ureters into the bladder, controlled by a ring of muscle ready for you to wee it out of the urethra. Note, ureter enters the bladder. Urethra is to the outside of your body. If we could zoom in just a little bit, we would see that a typical kidney has about 1 million nephrons. These are the functional units of the kidney. Don't ask me why, but someone decided to break with the Latin and use Greek for this one. So if your kidneys fail you, you will be taken to the renal unit of a hospital to see a nephrologist. So here we have the nephron. And there are actually two types, but for the IB, we can skip over this. If you're interested to know, I'm going to show you a juxtamedullary nephron. But you can just call it a nephron. That is perfectly fine for your exams. In reality, it all gets a bit squishy in there and it's quite compact. It has this part called the distal convoluted tubule, which winds back near the renal corpuscle, but I'm going to draw the nephron in a stretched out way, which is what a lot of textbooks do, and that helps you focus on the processes of each section. So stretching it out and drawing it a bit larger, in the top half of the nephron, we are in the cortex of the kidney. Down the bottom, the medulla. We start again with some blood, and that's important. Remember, the job of the kidney is to filter your blood. So in it goes from the renal artery via the afferent arteriole under quite a bit of pressure to a network of capillaries called the glomerulus. It leaves via the efferent arteriole. The words afferent and efferent mean coming and going and are used in other contexts of biology as well, like with neurons. The efferent arteriole carries on to the peritubular capillaries around the convoluted tubules up here and the vasa recta down here before returning to the ve renal vein. But you don't need that level of detail. And the blood network is in close proximity to the rest of the nephron, so substances can be returned to the blood. But I'm going to leave them off our diagram so it doesn't get too messy. Just know that lots of the things that come out um, that move out of our nephron here and pass back, um, eventually make their way back into the blood. Surrounding the glomerulus is the Bowman's capsule. Together, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule comprise the renal corpuscle. Zooming in a bit more, we can see the capillaries of the glomerulus are specialised to increase the rate at which blood plasma and solutes enter the lumen of the Bowman's capsule. Remember the term lumen is a space in any tube, like the lumen of the small intestine or an artery. So the process here is, well, the, the big idea, I suppose, is to get quite a lot of solution into the Bowman's capsule quite quickly, and we call the solution that passes through filtrate. Having high pressure and mesh or kind of sieve-like structures gets the filtrate across quickly, and we call this step ultrafiltration. 
To make them more porous than most other capillaries in the body, the glomerular capillaries are fenestrated. Back to our Latin. Fenestra is the word for window, and these capillary walls have little holes in them, making them extra leaky, but the holes are too small for red blood cells to get through. They are supported by a mesh of glycoprotein called the basement membrane, and cells from the epithelium of the inner wall of the Bowman's capsule called podocytes. They wrap around the glomerulus with foot-like projections, hence the pod part of their name, leaving filtration slits between them. Essentially, we have three layers of sieves, mesh, to get lots of the liquid bits and small dissolved things from your blood across quickly, but no big bits like cells or large proteins. Two of our sieves are cellular. They're made of cells. And the one in the middle is extracellular matrix. Your kidneys process about 180 litres of glomerular filtrate a day, which, by the way, is about the volume of a fridge. So as you can imagine, most of it needs to be saved. Now, the filtrate is going to eventually become wee, so it's tempting to colour code it yellow. But I've picked green for salt as a random choice to avoid confusion later. It's headed this way on its journey, the filtrate here, and actually by the time it's at the collecting duct, Ah, oh, maybe I will colour it yellow in that bit. But let's go back to the start. After the Bowman's capsule, we have the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means it's close, like the word proximity. It has a brush border to increase surface area for uptake of selected solutes, much like a small intestine. Its cells have microvilli. Crucially, some of the salt, and I'm saying salts here, but I'm talking about sodium and chloride particularly, and I'm just indicating sodium on the diagram, but crucially some of the salt and all of the glucose and amino acids in the filtrate are actively reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Well, that's assuming normal kidney function and normal blood glucose levels. If your blood glucose levels are quite high, there's only so much a kidney can cope with, and some glucose does make it into your urine which is where diabetes mellitus gets the second part of its name. The mellitus means honey because olden day doctors would detect the sweet taste of the urine. Ugh, sorry. And sorry, too much Latin today, I think, and gross medieval practices. So we let's move on from that. Key information, though, we have active transport. These cells, naturally then, are very mitochondria-rich for this reason. All those powerhouses... And adding in a bit more detail, glucose and amino acids are actually co-transported with sodium ions, which is also known as symport. Again, this is like what you've seen in the intestinal wall. Same sort of concepts transferring over. Water can then follow passively as it moves via, moves via osmosis to where the high solute concentration is. So plenty of transferable concepts from cells, from digestion, things we've seen before. Although a little aside for a minute, now, cells have plasma membranes with hydrophilic heads, which are water-loving, and hydrophobic tails, water-hating, like oil. They are a little leaky, and water can move slowly via osmosis, but they don't like crossing this middle part. And actually, many cells, including these ones in the proximal tubule, have channels to facilitate the movement of more water more quickly. They are called aquaporins, and are very narrow and charged in the centre so that only water can pass through. Some other processes are happening too, like some pH correction, exchanging bicarbonate ions and protons, or drugs may enter the filtrate here, but our main focus in this video is on the osmoregulation and key things like retaining those glucose molecules and amino acids. But this brings us to the kind of master part, the loop of Henle. It has a descending loop going down and ascending coming back up. The walls of each side are permeable to different things. Permeable means what they let through. The descending loop has lots of those aquaporins you mentioned to quickly allow water to passively move out of the filtrate into the surrounding blood and interstitial fluid. Interstitial means in the gaps, so it's the fluid between cells. It doesn't have channels for salt, though, this descending loop. Since we lose water, the further we descend, 
And let's get colourful and make that filtrate look a bit darker. So again, I've just used green as an arbitrary colour so we don't confuse it with anything else. And it's just to give us the visual we, we need. I hope you don't actually have green wee. Now, as we go back up the other side, these cells are permeable to salt, but not water. The opposite of what we had on the descending side. Salt passively moves out in the thinner part at the bottom and is actively pumped out in the thicker top bit. This level of detail is not required. The big idea to hang on to is which side is permeable to water and which side is permeable to salt. What we can see though, if I leave the shading like this, is that the salt concentration of the filtrate drops right back down again. Now this is why I didn't use yellow. If I let the yellow become faded, it might generate a misconception that everything in the urine became more dilute, and that's not true. The yellow part of urine, which is urobilin from the breakdown of red blood cells, would get more concentrated as water was removed in the descending loop, but it would stay about the same in the ascending loop, as it's only salts that leave here, not anything else. Chat to me if you want to know more about urobilin or urea for that matter, but here our focus is just on the salts and the water balance. Right, so our colour coding is an indication that all of our salt, or well, sodium particularly, our sodium concentration has gone up as we move down and then dropped again as we've ascended again. The key concept to play here too is that this is a loop which means the direction of filtrate flow produces a counter current. Since the arms of the loop are Henley run in opposite directions, you can see that in terms of salt concentration, the most dilute sections of each side are right next to each other, and the most concentrated sections are next to each other. This means there's always a small concentration gradient that can be used or that's not too steep to push against. And the water that has come out at the bottom just enough to make the salt diffuse at the very bottom. The pumping of a little bit of salt out of the not very salty filtrate here is still enough to draw out a bit of water from the not so salty filtrate here. This means you can get quite a long loop of Henley in desert mammals that always maintains a workable concentration gradient and it's able to conserve the maximum amount of water in this step. So the longer the loop, the more water can be saved. After the loop of Henley, we've made the interstitial fluid of the medulla quite hypertonic or above average saltiness. The distal convoluted tubule, on the other hand, has fluid that is hypotonic, hypo for low. And at this point, is we've done that because we've just pumped out lots of salt. So this has become quite watery. The distal tubule has some more pH regulating to do and also calcium balance under instruction from the parathyroid, but we're going to gloss over that. Now what we've got is a fairly low salt filtrate, but a high salt medulla fluid. So in the collecting duct where lots of nephrons join the party and they link up here and drain into one common collecting duct for several nephrons, we get to make an unconscious choice. Could we let a fair bit of not so salty filtrate out as urine, have lots of wee that's not concentrated? Or could we use the concentration gradient here in the medulla to our advantage to save more water and let out only a little bit of salty wee. The hypothalamus, a part of your brain that's vital to monitoring many bodily functions, keeps check on the solute levels of your blood. If blood solutes, so that's things like the salts, are low, then you can let a lot of that filtrate go and have lots of dilute urine. If salts are high, your blood is already very salty, you need to hang on to that water. The hypothalamus would then tell a nearby pituitary gland, which is our master gland of the endocrine system, to release antidiuretic hormone, or ADH for short. This causes the collecting duct to insert aquaporins, those little 
channels that facilitate water movement. So they would insert aquaporins into the duct wall, which would make it more permeable to water, and then water is going to follow that concentration gradient into the hypotonic medulla. If you can't remember which way around ADH works, or which one's a diuretic, which one's an antidiuretic, maybe you remember that caffeine is a diuretic and that makes you wee more. So an antidiuretic does the opposite. So let's keep darkening up that wing in my picture. Okay, what would an exam ask you? A long exam question might ask about the whole process of kidney function in mammals. What should be on our big kind of big ideas checklist? Let's start at the start. Okay, nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. Naming things is a good place to begin. You never know. Sometimes it's worth a mark. Ultrafiltration takes place in the glomerulus. It's made possible by fenestrations in the capillaries, a mesh-like basement membrane, and podocytes. The filtrate gets collected in the Bowman's capsule. Glucose and amino acids are actively reabsorbed from the filtrate in the proximal convoluted tubule, PCT here for short. Most osmoregulation takes place in the loop of Henle, or at least that then sets up the conditions for the subsequent effects on the collecting duct. And that's due to the countercurrent that keeps the medulla hypertonic or that makes this region down here very salty. The distal convoluted tubule, abbreviated here to DCT, regulates calcium ions and pH. The hypothalamus in the brain monitors blood solute concentration. It instructs the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone causes a chain of events that inserts aquaporins into the collecting duct making it more permeable to water. And then finish your answer with the actual result. If blood solutes are high, then more water is saved. If blood solutes are low, more water is excreted. So consider your checklist and then tailor your answer. What's the question actually asking? Is it asking about general kidney function? Or is it more specifically about osmoregulation? If it's the latter, remove the unnecessary info, like the bit about glucose reabsorption or pH regulation. Otherwise, you may lose a mark for clarity. What else? Let's see. An exam could get you to compare the composition of the renal artery, vein, and urine. So let's put that in a table. This might include the waste product urea from the liver which is the nitrogenous waste the kidneys remove. It's present in the artery, not much of the vein, and mostly excreted in the urine. The salts, we've just seen it's variable depending on whether they're concentrated in the blood or not. So it's a bit hard to predict where they'll be more or less. The same is true for water. Glucose should be mostly conserved in the blood. But in reality, the cells of the kidneys are metabolically active and actually use some of it for themselves. So will it be a little bit lower in the vein than in the artery and hopefully not present in the urine? Relating to that, you could think of some substances transported by the blood like oxygen. It too gets consumed by the cells for respiration. So it's highest in the artery and carbon dioxide will be highest in the vein. You would not need to worry about small amounts that transfer to the urine. An exam question could also ask about the composition of filtrate through different parts of the nephron, such as where glucose is present. It does enter the filtrate in the Bowman's capsule and then is present at the start of the proximal tubule, but nowhere else because it's actively reabsorbed there. Or maybe you just need to focus on the medulla, cover the top. And remember the three bits of tubing down here. What are they permeable to? Water, salt, water. Having trouble with which is which? Start at the right side. The big job of the collecting duct and ADH is to concentrate your urine to stop you from dehydrating. So that one has to be permeable to water, to reclaim lots of water when concentrating your urine. 
then alternate back in the other direction, starting with water, then salt, then water. This might help you answer questions about the ascending and descending loop of Henley. And that's us done. Let me know if you have any questions.